if you put a bunch of recruiters in a field, no candidates are going to show up, right? Like this is why recruiters, when they have parties, they have to involve alcohol and like giveaways. Mm -hmm. If you put a bunch of like really talented job seekers in a field, everyone's going to come to them. The companies, the recruiters, you know, everybody's going to show up. So with that analogy, I think you have to figure out who holds the power in your marketplace and who holds the power in the decision making. Um, and so I believe strongly that if we provide a great candidate experience, we are doing a service for our customers. If you have a shitty candidate experience, you are not going to retain your customers because they're not gonna be able to hire on your platform. You are the factor. Welcome to The Factor. I'm your host, Sonny Mayuba. I work with Sparrow Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm investing in founders who are building the things that make life worth living. We focus in three key areas, well-being, work and purpose, and human connection, and we back companies that have the factor. As a founder myself, I've gone from napkin to NASDAQ, and I've learned there are always key factors that separate success from failure. And on this show, we get the secrets from people who are the factor in the journey of growing a company. So meet Amanda Richardson. Amanda is the chief executive officer of CoderPad, where she runs a profitable company that assesses tech talent. She's worked in tech for many years, scaling companies to massive valuations and successful exits. And she's been a part of the crash and burn, which is arguable to say that may teach us more than the glory. Uh, and when it comes to energy and hustle, Amanda is it. She's got the factor. So on top of all that, she has the toughest job in the world. She's mom to a couple single digit aged humans, which uh, I've had a couple, but I'm not the mom. I know that's the hardest job there is. So kudos to that. So audience here on the factor, you are part of the show. Place your questions in the Zoom chat and have chosen, you get to ask Amanda live, ask me live, ask anybody live. Um, and check out my t-shirt, it's so sick. If you want one, ask a really good question and my partner in crime, Ha, she'll send you one. So let's dive in. Amanda, welcome, you are the factor. <laughs> Sunny, good to see you. Can I get a t-shirt? You can get a t-shirt. Well, I don't know, you gotta, let's see, let's see how good your answers are today. All right, here we go, yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna month. dangle that carrot, let's, let's just see. <laughs> But I know you'll crush it. You'll crush it. Um, hey, I'm so glad you're here. It's an honor and it's amazing to have someone of your caliber on the factory. So thank you for being here. Honored to be asked. Thank you for awesome. having me. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So you're a product expert. You've grown companies. You've been working a long time. You've had an amazing career in tech. And I want to touch on all of it today and then give the audience a chance to kind of touch on it as well. Um, oh, and audience, by the way, we will be, we are recording this live. We'll edit this down and it will be shared. You can share it with all of your friends around the world forever in perpetuity. You sign that agreement. Um, but let's start with where you are today, Amanda CoderPad. So tell us about CoderPad, why it's important. And then I really want you to tell us how you found yourself as CEO. Yeah. So, uh, well, CoderPad is a leading platform for assessing developer talent. We have both a synchronous and asynchronous um, IDE, which is developer speak for the development environment, uh, where candidate and um, uh, interviewer jump in, they code together, they work together, and rather than picking your developers based on where they went to school, the logos on their resume, or maybe you know making nicey nice with the recruiter, you actually pick a developer based on whether or not they can accomplish the job and the task at hand. That makes perfect sense. So that's pretty interesting. How does that, not to jump right into a heavy topic, but does that help with diversity? If done right, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, wherever humans are involved, there's real good opportunities for bias. Right. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of the things you saw, how did I become CEO of Coderback? One of the things that yeah. drew me to the company was the opportunity to flip hiring on its head, right? I'm not going to claim that we can fix the pipeline problem, but I can certainly address the signal problem and find better ways for people to get hired um, and better ways for people to get their foot in the door. Actually, next week we're launching a feature 
where you can put a link to a coder pad uh, take home challenge on your careers page. So you want to be a developer, click this link rather than like submit your resume so that what some recruiter can sit there and be like, Oh, you didn't work at Yelp or you didn't work at Facebook or you didn't go to Stanford or whatever it is. Um, then they'll knock you out of the system. Like, let's actually just see, you know, put up or shut up. Let's see your code. Let's see how good you are. Um, and have that automatically submitted to all the companies as a way of creating a pipeline and diversity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how is it working in terms of volume? I mean, who, how many people are using CoderPad? We have 1,700 customers. Uh, we've done nearly 3 million interviews at this point. Um, wow. We have uh, the FANG companies. Um, okay. so we yeah, are yeah. grateful um, for all of our fabulous customers from the bigs to the smalls. Um, interestingly, we are a kind of a self-serve bottoms up play. All of what's now like famous for Slack and people are talking about product led growth as like the new ism for describing this, but effectively you come in, you try our product, you, um, can start with a small plan as low as 50 bucks a month. If you're an individual contributor who just wants to do some hiring, we grow into team plans. And then we grow into our enterprise customers who we love and care passionately about and want them to help hire better people. And I would say are actually our best partners in trying to eliminate bias and be smarter about hiring. So when COVID hit, did that have any effect on the company? I mean, if, if engineers were, I mean, it had effect on every company. I know I'm looking at your face. I feel like but, what? <laughs> yeah. It had, yeah. Any effect, did, you know, this pandemic, did that have any What's effect coming? on you guys? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love your office. You guys are still coming in the office there. Yeah. It's so great. My basement, yeah. like everybody comes to my house still. Yeah. It's really nice. But you know, but if it were engineers showing their chops remotely anyway, so does your pipeline so, just keep, just keep growing or, or did, did you guys feel this effect? Or how did it affect uh, you? Mean, what ways did it affect you? I guess is the question. Super transparently. It's been a wild six months. Um, yeah. I would say, look, we, um, our, our sales pitch, my sales pitch in January was like, why are you interviewing people at a whiteboard? You should be interviewing people on a keyboard where they actually work. Like if you interview someone on a whiteboard, it's like, you know, Oh, you want to write for the New York times. Awesome. Here's a pen and some paper. Can you write me an article? Sell me so, this pen. You want to yeah, go in sales? Was, Sell me yeah, this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it was like so archaic. So of course, like it was a better way to do it. And then COVID hit and we're in San Francisco where I feel like we were pretty early adopters on the shutdown work from home sitch. Um, so March was a lot of our customers being like, oh my God, I need twice as much. Like we've got all these interviews that now have to happen remotely. How can I make this happen? Um, then we rolled hot in April where April was like uh, economic distress, massive unemployment. You couldn't open a newspaper without um, reading about all the layoffs and the complex complexities. And so that put a bunch of deals on hold. Um, and then, you know, May was layoffs. I think layoffs at FYI is like one of still one of my like bookmark tabs um, to track layoffs. And it's, I mean, they're still happening, right? Oh yeah. Like, it's, oh, yeah. um, it's tough out there for most people. And so, um, layoffs and hiring freezes are not good for us because you're not hiring and interviewing. Right. Um, and now I think we're, a lot of companies are turning the corner where I talked with a company, yes, a VP of engineering yesterday, who was like, look, we did a pretty big cut in May because we were uncertain about what this meant and where our, uh, business would be. Uh, but I think we cut too deep. So now we have a massive hiring lift. So. Mm -hmm. I say it's been a six months because, you know, we're, we are blessed Uncertain. and fortunate to be up year over year. Like we're up 40% over year over year. Like we're still profitable. Things are great. We've tripled the team, but wow. uh, on the flip side, like I do a lot of hair coloring. I <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Those are crow's feet. You're not seeing. <laughs> I have double down and eye cream. Right. <laughs> My Botox needles are are dull. No, you don't need that shit. Um, okay, so seventeen hundred customers, three million plus interviews, and you know, knowing you, you have had a lot of experience in marketplaces. I was in a marketplace. 
I get this question, you get this question all the time, you know, how do I grow a marketplace? Do I focus on supply side, demand side? Do I focus on both? Do I do a bunch of marketing after I built it? Do I focus only on product? Give us the factor secrets on how do you attack a marketplace? So full transparency, CoderPad is not really a marketplace because it's our technically not. I get it. Our yeah. customers bring in um, the candidates, but I, I, it still drives my thinking, right? Like right. at the end of the day, um, and I've done HR tech uh, for a while uh, in various stages. Uh, if you put a bunch of recruiters in a field, no candidates are going to show up, right? Like this is why recruiters, when they have parties, they have to involve alcohol and like giveaways. If you put a bunch of like really talented job seekers in a field, everyone's going to come to them. The companies, the recruiters, you know, everybody's going to show up. So with that analogy, I think you have to figure out who holds the power in your marketplace and who holds the power in the decision making. Um, and so I believe strongly that if we provide a great candidate experience, we are doing a service for our customers. If you have a shitty candidate experience, you are not going to retain your customers because they're not going to be able to hire on your platform. Yeah. So CoderPad, we'd say, is niche, right? I mean, you hire engineering talent. That's yeah. pretty niche. But you're the best in the world at You are the leader. It is amazing. And, I mean, evidenced by millions and millions of placements or, or interviews and placements. Is the niche enough? So, or, or, and when I ask that, you're a profitable company. It's a nice, strong company. You know, you can, you can run that forever. and you know, engineering talent will never go away, but is that enough? Um, do you think you, or do you, do you ever get the temptation to broaden the offering and, you know, create some more revenue channels? Yeah. I mean, this is the like yin and yang of, uh, your funding model, your business approach, your investor alignment, the incentives of your investors. Um, you know, I think the rule of thumb, whoever makes these rules of thumbs, um, is like you have to exit for five times the money you've raised or three times the money you've raised in venture capital to like get a decent return. Um, and so whatever money you take, you should be willing, you should have a plan to exit at 5x that, um, which is really hard if you look at some of these deals that go down, right? You raise... 100, 200 million dollars, like a billion dollars is still real money, people. Like that's a massive business. So um, with that, I would say, uh, yeah, we, I, you know, before uh, I got involved, I studied the market opportunity, live coding assessments. If you look at developers who are hiring and general spend, a number of interviews that are done, that addressable market's like 200 million. If you add in the asynchronous piece, it's another 300 million. So it's a $500 million market. Um, most of my great venture capital friends would be like, yeah, we're not into that, but I am lucky to have smart investors who um, care, kind of, they, they look at risk reward and they kind of run their portfolio a little bit differently and they are psyched about a profitable business with a $500 million market opportunity um, and are really excited to see us just, you know, a couple good clips of 50 yeah. to hundred percent. And we've got a real business. Yeah. You know, last I heard two, three, 400 million was a pretty solid number, <laughs> but I know some of your venture capital friends are like, Oh, too, too micro for me. I yeah. Mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty well, wild. Like, I know. It's pretty it's crazy. It's like a great lesson for people, right? Like I hear people all the time who like are always like, Hey, I have this idea and I'm going to go talk to venture capitalists. I'm like, do you really want venture capital in that? Like, is that really the problem? Like, is that going to be a billion dollar business? And do you want to have every board meeting when they're like, nice, I'm glad you closed another $5 million in contracts, but what you actually need to do is go get a $500 million contract. Right. Yeah, no, you're tapping right into something that I think our audience really wants to hear is, you said it really well, you're, you're lucky to have venture capitalists who are really, what you said is on your mission. They understand what you do and on the mission all the way to the, um, to the end game. H how do founders... Bo both new and seasoned founders watching the factor, how do they find the right investors? How do they do that? Yeah, that's a big question. No, when it's, yeah, full disclosure, I've definitely been in the situations where you've had 146 meetings and gotten no. So the idea of like, 
choosing your investor is both fantastically ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> and a non-existent luxury. Um, so I think here, look, and full disclosure, I'm not the founder of CoderPad. I was brought in by the investment group. And I think what I, so Vincent Wu is our founder. He's a fantastic guy. I consider him a friend. We're still in touch. Uh, what I would say he did really well was he from the beginning made sure he was profitable and that allowed him to be really picky about who he got involved in the business. He was really stingy and, um, stingy is a compliment. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when I joined the company, I was employee number five after wow. five years, there were four of us in the WeWork. Wow. And, um, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have robust systems. We didn't have a social media analyst. We didn't have, <laughs> we didn't have a data analyst. We didn't have snacks. We, we, snacks. We, 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 we did have snacks. I mean, you got it. Oh, you did have snacks. Okay. The important stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. They were like, but, but accounting order, was running Google Sheets. <laughs> orders from Amazon.com. Everything was QuickBooks Online. Like, Love it. You know? And I yeah. think like that just both instills a culture, but also like gives you a superpower. Um, where you can pick and choose your investors. And so then you can go out and find the investors that really align with what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. And if they say no, it's really great to be like, okay, cool. Great. We'll just keep remaining profitable and run our business with our five people. Yeah. I and love that. Brilliant. I mean, I've been around long enough to know that like all of these, you know, what's, what's a fad in fashion is also a fad in investing styles and, um, I mean, you and I both know profitability was like a bad word five years ago. And now it like is the equivalent of whatever the kids are saying these days on TikTok. Um, <laughs> so kids these days. Uh, so, I mean, like it, it all, it all comes around. I'm sure five years yep. from now, we'll look at this podcast and be like, remember yep. we were bragging about being profitable? That was profitable. How silly was that? Where's the growth capital? Exactly. Right, exactly. Where's your, yeah. whatever that yeah. multi number yeah. is. I don't know. Speaking of growth and rocket ships, you had a long journey at Hotel Tonight, which was um, near and dear to my heart. I'm still a customer, by the way. I use it all the Me time. Too. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I've used it from, from the early days all the way um, to today. Um, it was a rocket ship of growth. And I want to talk about the various roles you held and, and tell, us, tell us what factors led to such growth. Uh, insanity. Um, I mean, look, I, uh, Hotel Tonight was always knocked for being a niche product, right? I, so I joined yeah. the company in, I don't remember, 2013, maybe 12. I can't remember. Early. Um, early. Um, and I was a customer and I literally, and this is when we were actually just Hotel Tonight one night. Um, and I had to beg Sam, the CEO to hire me. And, um, we, I think the things we did really well there where we obsessed over the customer again, back to the marketplace, which mattered if we didn't have customers, but we had a ton of, you know, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have customers that were happy, but we had a bunch of hotels. The hotels would have left us. You have to bring them volume. And um, I think the other thing that was really smart and a great dynamic that Sam and Jared um, and Chris, the co-founders, just started on really early was figuring out pricing dynamics. At the end of the day, the market would clear at a price and the hotels always thought they could sell for more. And the customers always thought they could have gotten it cheaper. <laughs> and that's the pinnacle of Zen in that marketplace. And so, um, if I could do it all over again and, um, maybe that opportunity will come hotel tonight's now part of Airbnb. So who knows where it'll end up? Maybe the world needs a hotel tonight again. Um, you know, I would focus heavily on that pricing dynamic and how that all comes together. Yeah, that's an incredibly hard problem to solve. I know I attended it with one of my startups and I couldn't figure it out. It's really hard to, it's, it's easy, to, no, I'll say easy. You can build it, but to make it consummate, what you talked about, that pillar of Zen, to make that yeah. consummate in the marketplace, that is so complicated. Yeah. They figured, you yeah. guys, yeah, you guys figured it out. That's interesting. So yeah, acquired by, um, Airbnb for hundreds of millions. How was that march toward that? I mean, that must have been pure insanity. No, 
Yeah, smooth, easy. <laughs> it was super great. easy. A couple phone, yeah, a couple phone calls over the restaurant in San Mateo, right? Yeah, that's how it went. Yeah, it went from idea and garage to beautiful office to yeah. Airbnb welcoming us with open arms. Yeah. Just, no, no, I, I mean, mean it, was on, a, it was a slog, man. I mean, like yeah. these stories, like God, the headlines are great, but we're all like paddling like crazy ducks under the water out here, right? So. Yep. The good days were the record days. Um, then the record days were followed by the app crashing and not able to <laughs> yeah. <them> up. <laughs> I mean, and then there were the bad days where you're like, clearly the system's broken because no one's buying anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're great. We're stupid. We're awesome. Oh my God, we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, that's how it feels. Exactly yeah, no. It feels. And, and then there's like the massive, like we can't hire fast enough. And then we were pretty uh, public about our... Um, our shift to have to get profitable and like we did a layoff at a time when no one was doing layoffs and i mean god those were the worst i mean yeah, when you lose when you lose friends and you lose teammates like oh. it hurts and, and i'll tell you what it does it's like it makes you hungrier for success for those people um because you're like i'm never doing this again never ever doing this again like it's the rock bottom of business that i think um i won't call it healthy like no one needs to hit rock bottom bottom to get healthy but it is the gut reality check that just drives you to work a little bit harder and make sure you get it right it's way more motivating actually than the like high fives after you close the big check and you do the little happy hour cupcake party yeah agreed now you started there early and you ascended to the C-suite of Hotel Tonight. So, I mean, a couple things. One, I'd like to know how are the dynamics because you know executive teams are, are tough, especially at startups, startups that are growing and, and booking some real, real revenue through the system. But also, you know, as you tell us a little bit about that, give some advice on how, how companies should form their executive team. You know, your, uh, Series A companies, most of them don't have an executive team, right? The team is closer to CoderPad, you know, it's six, 10, 12, 14 people. And they're like, exec team? Well, we have our CEO and we all meet at every all hands all the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> so at some point you need an executive team. Uh, how do you companies do that? I think the thing that I've grown to appreciate now, having done this a couple of different times is it's, it's a work in progress always, right? Mm. So there's never like an optimal setup. There's never an optimal team structure. There's never an optimal exec team. Um, and it's always a point in time for what's doing us the best right now. So um, I think if you can take that lens to realize just like your product, you're constantly iterating to make it better and test and learn and figure things out it will help CEOs move faster, um, but also help CEOs be more comfortable with the, with the, uh, with the change. Um, and it's hard, right? Because you're, what very candidly is insensitive about that is like, I'm a CEO and so I'm just gonna experiment with a couple promotions and see how they go. This yeah. is people's livelihoods, right? You can't, I don't know how much I can cuss. You can't mess with that. You can fucking cuss. Um, okay, great. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't We're all adults here. Right? Like, it's, it's real. Like, that's real to them. Like, they have families to support. They've got situations they need. To, you know, like, this is livelihood. So I, I don't want people to hear that, like, everything's just an A-B experiment. But I think what is important to hear is that um, you can, there's never, like, the perfect solution. And you kind of have to iterate through it. And we did that at Hotel Tonight, right? Like, we... Um, I think at one point our executive team was like 11 people. At some point it was like five people. Yep. And it's this constant balance of, um, that balance of like harmony and like-mindedness with, with, uh, challenge and, uh, constructive disagreement. Um, and when it's too like-minded, you think it would feel good. Like, I just want people who are like me and get along with me. And that does feel good until you look around the room and you're like, wait a minute, these are all people like me who are not challenging my ideas and we're not making smarter decisions. But then you get into those conversations with really talented people who come at the world a very different place. And you're like, oh, why can't you just agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> 
Like it's true, yeah. right? Like it's a really because we're trying hard. to get to we're trying to get to a better place. That's why. Right. Yeah, I know. Right, and yeah. I, I I will uh, kick myself for not bringing this up, but I need every single CEO who wrestles with those decisions to recognize where is people like me versus people who are smart. Um, there are some high profile conversations happening right now around Pinterest, Carta. I I feel for those female executives and how they felt pushed out and were pushed out of that organization because they didn't get along. Um, right. And that is a very fine line and something that everybody needs to be sensitive to just because, anyway, I could rant. No, this is, this is important. I mean, okay, great. Yeah, I saw the Pinterest blog. I mean, it's about, um, yeah, female executive being pushed out uh, right at the, basically the transaction. And, that was a harsh dose of reality. I mean, we're in 2020. And I think we were talking about diversity in tech 10 years ago, 15 years ago even. So is this still a big problem, Amanda? Oh no, what's COVID? What's diversity? <laughs> what you has about? COVID, hey, by the way, has COVID affected your life at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, diversity is a problem. Um, and I think it's, and look, I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not in the room. I don't understand the dynamics. I don't understand the situation, but there's so much of that story that I feel is similar to other rooms I've been in mm. um, on both sides of the table, right? Um, and I get the pressures to just move fast and just get along with me. And like, and, and that shorthand that happens that is everyone likes people who are like themselves um, but that we what ends up happening like. is you get a room of people who look just like you. Um, and then um, I, 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 it's just, it's, I mean, it's, it's hard on all sides, but the world and the leaders need to be more open. And very candidly, I would also say the boards need to support these leaders in finding a way to have more confrontation above them and below them. Um, and support them, right? It's really hard to be the CEO when you have what I'll call a, a, a squeaky executive, for lack of a better term, right? Someone who's not totally aligned and for the board to not be like, put that person in their place or get them out. That is not the language we need to be using. We need to be talking about like, okay, can we dial this one back and see what of this is interpersonal and what of this is business critique? And can we actually make smarter decisions based on this? Um, and how do you foster those dynamics? Um, that's well hard. said no it is it is I mean, the board to the exec team dynamics are just critical let's go back in time a little bit to a company that I loved you worked at Prezi now sure. factor audience if you don't know Prezi just go look up Prezi it's so rad I mean Prezi was so rad I used Prezi like 2010 11 12 and if you don't for those of you who don't know Prezi it was a cloud-based presentation software. So think of oh, Keynote hey. meets, what, yeah, it is, I say was, is. Keynote meets PowerPoint, but but with eight dimensions of just so killer. I would I would take my presentations into rooms and people would be like, whoa, what is this magic trick you're doing? So what'd you do at Prezi? And and was, was it the first cloud-based presentation software or was there one before it? It was the first one I ever used. That's a great question. Um, I think... I think it was the first real one. Slides first came out one. about the same time, um, so you'd be remiss to not mention Google Slides as a cloud-based presentation tool. Technically, but yeah. We okay. The, I think what we Prezi is for sure the most different. And what I loved about what I love about the Prezi problem is, if I if you wanted to describe for me your kitchen you would probably start at like, okay, there's the oven and then you move to the left and there's the toaster and then I've got the cabinets here and I keep this here and then on the other side is the sink, right? Right. And that's how you would describe a situation. Yet when we're asked to describe the lay of the land for our businesses in like a quarterly board meeting, you do bullets, which right. makes no sense. Like <laughs> that's not how a business exists. And so Prezi enabled you to have that conversation with more spatial recognition. And uh, they actually have done, they've done psycho psychological, I don't know, whatever, studies that show people remember things spatially better 
than if listed in bullets. And so that was the power of Prezi. That is the power of Prezi, right? Yeah. You want to convince an audience of something, you guys would be so much more impressed by what I was saying if I was actually moving you through a conversation as opposed to sitting here like waving my hands in my basement. Um, <laughs> So that's the power of Prezi. It's a fantastic product. I led product and design over there, um, which is really complicated from like a user perspective and user adoption perspective. Um, the team was incredibly talented uh, and the, the technology is actually really hard. Like pan zoom, if anybody's ever worked in those kinds of like spatial concepts of in and out, like it's like Google maps that you can create yourself quickly, right. collaboratively, and then share. Um, so it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty robust system. My time there, um, my time there was challenged, not challenged, but my time there was fantastic. But I think ultimately one of the big challenges we had was we were built on flash and oh, okay. the of the Mac, like, yeah. maybe those, I know you want to talk about the good factors, but these are like one of no, the, no, no, we factors. need, we need the bad. I mean, those are. The, that that is like the factor right there, like betting yeah. on Flash, yeah. Yeah, and so they had to, re, we had to rewrite off Flash at a time when HTML5 and JavaScript just weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really hard to get the smooth frames per second that you needed to render mm -hmm. to be able to do that zoom in another technology. And that team figured it out. Kudos to those guys. Like they worked for years to figure that out but that was kind of the like underlying story that we were built on flash in 2008 when it was like great right. and yep. then all of a sudden max mobile ios flash is done and your like core product no longer renders on a browser like you're fucked that's Hard. totally fucked that's crazy but but in that 08 09 10 11 i mean it was spreading it was oh, growing yeah. virally. Yeah. I mean, Prezi did, had no like big hype persona. I don't, I don't know that it ever did any marketing and you would know, but how did you guys grow? How did you, you know, how did, how did people start adopting it? Another stealthy profitable company. Yep. Um, so always solved for zero in annual planning. So what is our revenue going to be? Solve for zero. This is how much money you can get. Um, nice. as opposed to the inverse of like, I need 400 developers and then I need 200 people to manage the 400 developers. <laughs> yep. um, none of those conversations. So that was good. And then look, it helps to be a presentation tool, right? Every time you sat in a meeting, Sunny, you had 10 people around the right. table like, what's that? That's true. Um, yeah, that was that was your Bauer coefficient. It was a little bit like the Facebook friends. Like, I'm going to hook you because if you want to talk to me, meet me on Facebook. Right. Okay. So that was, that's right. That makes sense. And the other, the other unknown trick was, um, so the paywall was set at privacy, which was controversial, but smart. Um, and kudos to Peter Arvai and HP um, and Adam who started that company because they set that paywall at privacy, which meant that if you didn't want to pay for it, that was cool. You, but your presentation was public which meant that we were SEOing it so that you pick the random topic and suddenly Prezi pops up in there. You're like, you want yeah. to do a research project on like the history of women's right to vote. And I guarantee you one of the top 20 URLs was a Prezi presentation about the women's right to vote. That's right. Oh, that's brilliant. That's a growth hack. Yeah, that's brilliant. I remember yeah, growth hacks before so, they were called growth hacks. Yeah, before it was called growth <laughs> hacks, right? It was just like a novel trick. It was called tricks. Hey, we do tricks. So what's up with Prezi right now? Like, where are they rocking? Are they just cruising? Yeah, they're what? still jamming. I think they have a new bigger office. Um, so the, cool. Uh, yeah. So the company was founded actually in Hungary. So Budapest and San Francisco were the primary offices. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they've grown a ton, um, yeah. new offices here. I think they, um, Peter Arvide just moved to executive chairman, poor guy, poor guy. I mean, I talk about being tired, having done these jobs for four or five years and he was yeah. there 15. He finally, 15, like, yeah. guess somebody yeah, else take this. So Jim B who's been there a long time, um, has taken over, which is great. Then they've done, um, they've taken some private equity money and keep, they nice. keep going and I'm so, cheering them on. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I'm down with Prezi. When I saw, I was like, oh, Prezi, I haven't logged into my Prezi account. I need to go log into my Prezi account and pay for it. 
because I used a free one plenty. I'm sure some of my old presentations are on SEO somewhere on page like seven. Um, it's all right. potential, but yep, it's there. <laughs> That's right. Hey, hey, I paid for it one or the other. Um, audience, make sure you drop your questions into the Slack. The awesome Veronica is going to be popping them over to me so you can ask live. Uh, I have a few more questions for Amanda, then I'll turn the mic over to the Factor audience. But um, so you were a member of the world's biggest uh, streaming company. Is that right? Oh, wait, not the world's business. Could have been the world's biggest streaming company. You were at <laughs> Rabbit, like you were CEO of Rabbit. Like, CEO of Rabbit. I don't even know if people here know about Rabbit. Why don't you tell us the story of this video streaming company called Rabbit? Yeah, so Rabbit was the best way to watch TV with your friends online. Um, started. That should be huge right now. Five or six years ago. I mean, uh, it's almost too soon in a way that it's not too soon. So it started <laughs> five or six years ago. I was brought in, um, I guess it was summer of 2018. We had 10 months of runway to go and we worked really hard to strike up a partnership, get it funded, uh, find a business plan. I would say we, we had like two or three million active users who would come in and watch TV together. Wow. Um, yeah, it was a big product and a lot of communities were formed um, and like meaningful, great communities. People who met over, I think our longest running channel was a woman who loved South Park. And there was a strong contingent of like 20 people globally who just loved South Park and loved to watch <laughs> South Park. And they just 24 seven stream South Park and just like hung out together <laughs> and talk about like the little nuances of South Park. And I love that. Like we were building communities um based on content and um this was one i remember investors used to say when i would pitch it they'd be like but how many of these are real friends and i'm like what do you mean by real friends old man yeah, and they would be that. like you know people they met in person i'm like they are real friends because <laughs> they haven't met them in person and like thank god they turned ready player one from a book to a movie at the time and i was like go watch ready player one it'll all make sense to you right totally. um better yet but, read it um, you're literally like pitching and talking to people who are like, this makes no sense. How is this ever going to work? Like no one's ever going to do this. What do you mean people are going to watch TV online together? Um, I should that was their reaction just a few years ago. That was their yeah. reaction in May of last year. <laughs> like in May of last year. We shut wow. down May 15th of last year and it was horrible. And I pitched every single one of these streaming companies, production companies, media companies that are now trying to figure out how to build a product, how to stream their content, how to get around Netflix, how to engage their customers. Right. And, you know, I just, it turns out global pandemic was what I should have actually pitched. And they would have- Oh yeah, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's coming, <laughs> you, but we were, like we were talking about before the show, Ooh, you theater. needed the cardboard sign with the Bible verse that said, the, the pandemic is coming, fund this company because everybody's going to be on rabbit. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> that would have worked. Yeah. Okay, yeah. forgive me. You're right. It, it was too soon. My bad. I, no, no, it's the okay. Last, the last eight months have felt like a 400 year. So. They're all too soon because they're all like your babies. Yeah, right? like, they're babies. Like, I know. They, you're, they're literally yeah. like tattooed on my soul. That's crazy. So, you know, I just finally, Krista from Sparrow just got me into Clubhouse. <laughs> and you know i i i love hype but i just kind of just tend to if it gets too hyped to go uh but i went in and it's really rad like it's 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 rad. i like it and and it's fun it's what you were doing was you were clubhouse with the common thread i mean the threat with one more layer meaning like let's watch a tv show together and chat about it you were yeah. like science fiction theater or whatever, you know i mean it was it's crazy and it's clubhouse is weird like have you used it yet by chance or yeah, any of those I'm type of four-year-old, uh, remember? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You have Teletubbies and Thomas the Train. That's I haven't your seen clubhouse. a television that hasn't been playing Octonauts <laughs> in weeks. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, here it's so crazy. You just pop in a room, and people are chatting, like this room, very like this very room here, and just people are chatting, and they could be talking about their cat, could be talking about The Simpsons, could be talking about something heavy. And then you either just listen or join the conversation. So yeah, that's, that's tough. So, and it was, what, what happened? What were the factors that, that took the company down? Uh, cash burn. Cash burn. <laughs> that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. 
the good news was that the financial planning was really easy. We had no revenue. So ah. Zero was really easy to forecast. Um, yeah. And there was, I underestimated, underappreciated content rights and the challenges of content rights, which is naive to say in hindsight, but um, I was like, we're making a great product. We have incredible user engagement, like 3X the engagement of a Netflix user. Like people love us. Um, we're going to figure out a way to monetize this. But when you remove the content back to like, where's the power in the marketplace? When you remove the content, people were just showing up and were like, what? I'm just, right. what am know, I paying for? Here's, yeah, oh, no, it was free. What There's am no I doing? Right. Just what am I what doing? Am I, just, what am I doing? Like, yeah. why are we what am here? I doing? Yeah. What are we going to talk about? Um, even though our number one content source was YouTube, interestingly, people hmm. just wanted to hang out and be together. But there's all these complications when you're monetizing someone else's stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was probably the biggest challenge that I both underestimated and we couldn't have gotten around. Um, if I could do it all again, I would have tried to just charge people and figured out the legal aspects later and just to get some more runway. Um, or try to figure out a rev share sitch and be like, look, yeah, YouTube will pay you back, right? Some portion of right. this. Um, just let us have rights to the content. But uh, it was more Which would be open doors right now. I mean, that would be wide open. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've been through the failure. So congrats on getting through it. It's not Thank fun. You. It burns, but you learn a lot. Tons. Oh, I, I learned way more in that. Well, I mean, I don't know. You learn a lot. In every you, you learn a lot. Yeah. yeah. I learned a lot. That was a master class in corporate finance, investors, bankers. Um, mm. <laughs> Big hearts. <laughs> it, had dad, all yeah. the, it had all the ingredients. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you hear what I said, Amanda? Oh, you mean like big hearts and lots of empathy. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of love. Those are great. Yeah, a lot of love. Yeah, a lot of love and, and a lot of a lot of Zen circles. All right, we're, we're going to the audience. We're going to the audience, and we're going to put you on the factor hot seat. So the first question, oh, it's from a good friend of mine, Veronica Reeves. Veronica, you got the mic. Hi, Amanda. Hello, <laughs> Veronica. Go easy on me. Okay, well, so, you know, in preparation for this episode, looked into your background, was super excited to talk to you because you are one of the few women that has made it to the C-suite at multiple big name tech startups. So first off, thank you. And I wanted to ask, you know, I saw in 2015, you shared a girl's guide to product management at Mind the Product. And I thought, wow, this is super brilliant. Now you've been CEO. And so for the women in our audience, what's your girl's guide to CEO? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I did a lot more prep for that conversation than I'm going to do for this 30 second answer. Um, <laughs> but, but with that, I mean, I think um, there is a part of the world is not going to come to you. You have to go to the world. Um, you are more prepared than you think you are. And um, I should have actually uh, carried the mug. I have a mug that says, carry yourself with the confidence of a mediocre white man. Um, but I will tell Ooh. you, no offense, no offense to the mediocre white man. <laughs> but I think there is, I mean, there's a lot of truth to imposter syndrome. There's a lot of truth to women feeling uh, like they haven't checked all the boxes. Um, I mean, I go through this still. I mean, I had my review with my board um, on Tuesday and they were my mid-year review and they were like complimenting my leadership skills. And I was like, oh, oh really? Oh, thanks. Um, in that way that you're like, of course, you've done this multiple times, but it's all in our head. So I think that's like the point one, two, three, and through to 73 on the girl's guide to being a CEO. The other one is put your hand up. So I ended up in a CEO role, not because I thought I could get a CEO role. I actually, um, so this is uh, the names shall be saved to protect the innocent, but um, I was interested in potential, I was interested in a COO role um, I had not had that role yet. I was contacted about a role. So I went through the process with the person or with the company. 
Um, and got all the way to final stages. We're sorting through the deals. I've met the board members. We're figuring out the terms. We're actually having, this was before coronavirus, we're having a beer on a Friday afternoon. It was like 5.45 and I was like, hey, I gotta go. I gotta meet my nanny at 6.30. And the CEO was like, you have kids? I was like, yeah. And um, I was like, yeah. he's like, how many? I was like, well, one, well, we got a nanny. Like what's the big deal? But at this point, in most jobs I interview for, I'm like 10 or 15 years older than the CEO. So this is like new to them. Uh, and he was like, well, are you going to have another kid? And I was like, well, it's funny you should mention that I'm actually pregnant. Um, cause I was, and I didn't, I don't ever believe in lying. Cause I'm just not smart enough to remember the lies. So, uh, he's like, Oh, well, you're drinking a beer. And I was like, yeah, I don't have time to explain to you how this works, but don't worry. The baby <laughs> will be fine. I will be fine. You will be fine. No one will get sued in this. Um, Two weeks later, three weeks later, mediocre white man. No, he's, I'm sure he's very talented. A uh, different white guy who knows the investors and is not married and doesn't have kids shows up and is, gets the job. And so I sit down with the recruiter afterwards and he was like, why did you want that job anyway? I was like, well, I want to be CEO someday. And in order to be CEO, you know, I've done all these different pieces and I need to go be COO to be CEO. And he was like, what? Just go be CEO. I was like, what do you mean? He was like, just go and be CEO. That's like absurd. And I was like, oh, and within two weeks, I had four CEO interviews. Fuck so yeah. there you go. Just put your hand up, ladies. And by the way, the world is looking for our hands up right now. Like, for God's sakes, it's about time. But they're finally like looking and actively trying to think about how they can incorporate women and um, underrepresented groups. <laughs> kind of, hopefully, at the table. Uh, so meet them where they are, but also put your hand up and grab them and shake their necks. Great advice. Um, and great question, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Arvind. Arvind, you got the mic with Amanda. Hit it. Hey, Amanda, can you hear me? I can. Hey, Arvind. Hey, um, first of all, thanks so much for, you know, like for quarter pad. First of all, kudos to your team. And I must say that I have been on both sides of an interview. I'm a software engineer myself, but I love building products. Um, I've, I've been an interviewer and an interviewee, at least like I've contacted around like 40, 50 of them. Um, you've definitely solved the pain point of whiteboard interviews. Yeah. And I couldn't even imagine like, you know, like phone screen would be absolutely difficult without CoderPad. So uh, that was my user testimonial for you. Thank you. Uh, I will quote you on that all, the, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so um, this was one of my early startup ideas. Is I always think that um, IQ is very important and CoderPad does their job really well uh, with help of IntelliSense and code suggestions and all that. But I, have also, I also feel that there is this concept of EQ that is missing with technical interviews. Mm -hmm. And, and I, would, I, I thought that there was a real opportunity to enhance, you know, like, or pivot this to engineering and product leadership interviews, uh, if you could combine IQ and EQ. Uh, if you ever have to pivot into one, how would you do that? Are, are there any, um, you know, like, is that in the road, roadmap? So, this problem. So no, it's not in the roadmap, but you're right. I mean, I think, and I, the question I actually thought you were gonna ask me is that would I take someone more technically proficient or more EQ proficient? Um, and I would say both, yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, yes, please. And make them have a unicorn with sparkles. Um, but I would also <laughs> say that, I mean, yes, both, always. Um, but I think it depends on the dynamics of the team. But in my experience, having worked with thousands of developers at this point, I always give tie to the EQ. Because you just need to have that user empathy and that ability to relate to the user and interpret their needs in a way that uh is meaningful and now eq manifests itself in a lot of different ways don't hear that you need to be an extrovert or whatever that means like you just need to like be able to read a situation um and have that empathy um but i think you're right it, um i don't know how i would build an eq interview I guess that's part of what people try to figure out with um, kind of these scenarios, like tell me a time when you had a really difficult conversation. Um, there are other ways to do it. I mean, like you can test EQ, right? Like there are, 
programmatic tests online that clinical psychologists, I hope, somebody with some skills. Yeah, no, that's that. right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I. Predictive index and those types. Yeah, right. And I think they're really, um, I think they're pretty good. We, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was not uncommon to take one of those tests before you took a job. Um, I think if I put a test in front of a candidate now in any role and said, I'm going to give you a psychological test, please spend two hours on this. And I'm going to get a read back on your EQ level. They would like sue me and f run for the door. Um, but I do think there's a lot of validity in that, right? In terms of there aren't right or wrong answers, but it's like, how do you work around team chemistry? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And um, I don't consider myself an amazing hirer. I consider myself a decent hirer, which means I'm probably like a 501 batting average. Um, so good. if you can make me better, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I have a big write up on this on how to measure EQ. If you're ever interested, I could send that to your email or to the Amanda at coderpad.io, please. Or, yeah, I'll, yeah. That. yeah. That was yeah, my sure. early, that was my first startup idea, and ha I pivoted into a blue collar hiring now. But but yeah, I wanted to send that to you because if it ever it was helpful to you in future. So. Sweet, send yeah, it to I me too, it. Arvind. I want to see it. Sunny at Sparrow.vc. Awesome, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Arvind. Great question. Okay, we have another question from Minakshi. Minakshi, are you there? Hi. Yeah. How are you? Hey. I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm great. I'm enjoying the conversation. Uh, loving it. So my question was, what, what is the biggest business challenge you are facing right now? And how do you plan to tackle it? Ugh, which one? Um, all right, the biggest business challenge at a time when you are uh, hiring software in a crazy era. Um, I don't know that I've got one. I've got, I've got many. I've got so many challenges. I think... Um, one of the things uh, we're wrestling with, I'm wrestling with, very frankly, is figuring out the right growth levers um, very candidly when you're selling a tool to developers. To the developer community out there, um, you are a hard skeptical group of people to reach. Um, and that's tough. Go to market's really hard, right? You think about, um, you know, and I talk to people, I talk to other CEOs and they're like, well, just hire a sales team. And you're like, who are they going to call? I, I don't even have a work phone number. I mean, we, I, I fill out these contracts and they ask for the company phone number. And I'm like, I guess I put down my cell phone, I guess. Um, but like, if you're a developer, you're like, I'm not going to put down my cell phone number. Don't call me. So I think reaching that audience is just, it's just a challenge. Um, and then I think... Um, beyond that, it's, uh, very candidly, it's leading a team and a remote team in an era of COVID when three quarters of my team, I would say all of my team are wrestling with something, um, at home, uh, whether, you know, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, my childcare has been cut in half. My two-year-old inevitably shows up in our all hands every week, no matter how many times, like. I asked the nanny to come a little bit later, my husband to come in first, like he showed up again today. And then he like hits the buttons and you're like, ah. So I think leading a time, leading a team that's growing in a time when everyone's remote and everyone's dealing with a lot. And there's a lot of challenges that are forcing us all to be asynchronous, even if we don't want to be asynchronous. Um, it's hard, it's really hard right now. Uh, it's never easy. But I do just kind of feel like we were joking earlier, like, what else could 2020 bring? Don't say that, because every Please time don't. I say that, like, so, there's like a <laughs> massive hurricane. There's, you know, like more police shootings. Like, please stop. Can we all just like yeah. sit down and not do anything for four months? Um, so anyway, there, it's just, it's a really hard time to be, it's a hard time to be a leader in companies. Last question is from Tara Hernandez. Tara, you have the mic, and you have Amanda. Hey, Tara. Hi, Amanda. Thanks so much for a great conversation. Um, oftentimes, we find that um, sometimes uh, employers make judgments based on the name mm. of the potential employee. 
And I was wondering whether or not there was anonymity around the submissions and so that you are just um, submitting the actual results of whatever performance tests that have been um, administered. I love that. Uh, yes, I love that. And you are near and dear to my heart. I have a daughter named Blake for a reason. Um, Cause I do believe this is a, th I mean, this is, I don't believe this is a thing. This is proven facts um that this is a thing so um shout out to blake ann uh the way we deal with this in coder pad is we really try to get i mean look i am incredibly sensitive to personal data and i try to get as little personal data as i can on candidates um because i know these biases exist so we actually just create a letter number uh, slug for every candidate that we try to have um that is the basic identifier. Companies need a way to organize. Oftentimes the organization requires them to put a name in. We really encourage, you know, A. Richardson. Um, but even, you know, Richardson says a lot about who you are, right? Like there's a lot of uh, stuff that comes across in all the names. So wherever possible, we like to keep an anonymous slug and really have it be about the candidate's work product. Um, yeah, it's real, Tara, yep. That's cool. Um, Amanda, you're such an inspiration. It, it, I mean that wholeheartedly. You're a badass and you're charismatic, way more charismatic than me, which makes me jealous, but I can live with it, I guess, since we're friends. Um, where did you grow up? <laughs> well, I was, uh, we joked about this earlier, but it wasn't a joke. I was yeah. born on a farm. Um, uh, which means I'll never live on a farm and I will forever live in a city. Like born um, on the farm, like born in the hay, like, you know, baby Jesus, <laughs> like that, like but the lambs. I was, born, and the... I was born in a community hospital. 30 okay. Miles from my in house. a farm okay. town. Okay. That's still, okay. In a farm, <laughs> we lived in the middle of nowhere. We had you no know, locks on our doors. We never closed our windows. Uh, you know, the nearest yeah. neighbor was like a 25 minute walk through the woods. I was a tree farm. Um, but then I, I spent most of my like formative years in Virginia. So, yeah. uh, grew up, so you're, uh, you're, pretty far outside DC. And that's pretty cool. I mean, you, you came from rural D outside of DC and now you're in a, a C-suite or CEO executive in Silicon Valley. That is an inspiration. I really mean it. It's awesome. Well, thank you. I think uh, not knowing what you're getting into is like the secret of success, right? Like, Oh yeah. I know what this world was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, totally. I always do things. If you look at my, my old track record, I always do things I have no clue about. Yeah. And a couple of times it works out, but mostly, yeah, you, you get a good experience. But my wife's like, will you stop doing things you don't know shit about? I'm like, yeah, probably not. <laughs> oh, it's way more fun. I mean, it's humbling. It's way more fun. Totally yeah. humbling. Totally humbling. Yeah. Well, you're amazing. And um, I'm so glad you're leading the charge at CoderPad and they're lucky to have you. And we were super lucky to have you on The Factor. Sonny, it's been a ton of fun. I will come back anytime, say the word. And thank <gasps> yes. you to all the audience for all the questions. Like that's really scary. Cause you didn't know oh, what yeah. people were gonna ask, but um, thanks for the hard, but not too hard questions. Yeah, for the, for the record, we don't know what they're gonna ask either. This is all legit. So The Factor audience is, is is straight up real. Fun so fact. audience, thank you. Yeah. Can I interrupt? A fun fact. Yeah, go. One time I had this like, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor, I had this one moment to be in the live audience. You're walking in and some handler was like, do you have a question for the governor? And I was like, yeah, I want to know what keeps him up at night. And they're like, great question. And I got put on stage and I was like, ah, oh. it, like it was like a CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever town hall. And I was like, they were like, do you have a question student? And I was like, yes, Mr. Governor, I'd like to know what keeps you up at night. And for those of you who don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger, I have no idea what I'm talking about. He's not a native American. Um, he's like, wasn't born. He's Austrian. He's Austrian. And yeah. he was like, I sleep great. What do you mean I don't sleep? I, I sleep on my back. And then I, like the whole thing was lost on him. So you just never even know where the layups are gonna go. That is the extended yeah. version of like, you just never know where the questions are gonna go even when you think they're easy. So there it is. Oh my gosh, context and wording so matters. That's like when you send that Slack message at three in the morning and then you read it the next day and you're like, oh, now I know why everyone's pissed at me. Exactly. I worded that poorly, ooh. <laughs> See, what you should have asked him was, tell us about filming Total Recall. That's what you should have asked him because I love that movie. So, 
That's phenomenal. Audience, thank you so much for attending. You are what makes the factor. Please follow at CoderPad. Follow at Amanda Rich 01. That's at Amanda Rich 01 to stay in touch with Amanda. And we're going to post this episode of The Factor online next week. You can always follow me at Sunny Mayuba. Good luck spelling that. And at Sparrow Adventures. Uh, be on the lookout for episode six, where we're going to have Amanda again, because she actually said, hey, uh, any time I'll come back. And guess what? In two weeks, we're going to have Amanda again, which is going to be great. Thanks for doing that. I know you're not too busy as a CEO of a, co of a profitable company, so no big deal. But Amanda, you're awesome. Thank you for being the factor. And until next time, stay safe, never give up. And if you're a company that is really awesome, making the world uh, worth living in, you're looking for investments, send me your deck. So until next time, thanks everybody. Goodbye.